We know the story by now. Two charismatic MIT graduates travel west to Idaho National Laboratory and are amazed by the nuclear technology that we abandoned for some reason in the 1950s and 60s. In order to set this right, they decide to start their own nuclear company. They begin to travel around the country making speeches and presentations about how they're going to take nuclear waste and turn it into energy. Then they find backing from Silicon Valley VC startups and investors, and soon their little startup becomes the hottest property in town. I am, of course, talking about Transatomic. But the parallels between Transatomic and Oklo are quite eerie. On their website, which is still up, they say they've gone back to the beginning of the nuclear industry to explore another path. And unfortunately, the industry has become locked into one design, the light water reactor. So they're challenging this strategy and have returned to begin exploring another path, the molten salt reactor. So we have a company that took some technological work done in the 1950s and 60s and decided to make a reactor design out of it. Which if we then look at Oklo, we see a lot of similar claims. Cutting edge innovation and uniquely able to recycle used nuclear fuel. And a supposed proven technology. Again, going back to 1964 with the experimental Breeder Reactor 2, which proved the concept of fuel recycling and passive safety characteristics. With EBR2 being a liquid metal cooled, metal fueled fast reactor. So we have a company that set the goal of burning nuclear waste in order to generate electricity. Not the same technology that Transatomic intended to use, but an experimental type of reactor that really hasn't been built in the US a lot. However, Transatomic ran into some of the realities of nuclear energy. It's complicated, expensive, and difficult to actually get the design right. They made some mistakes in the preliminary design, and instead of actually consuming spent nuclear fuel, the plant would produce it instead. This technical setback essentially doomed the company, and in 2018, they decided to close operations. But in this latest wave of AI and data center excitement, Oklo seems to have progressed a bit farther. And on Monday, September 22nd, announced that they were groundbreaking their first Aurora powerhouse. One, two, three. And as a result, their stock has gone absolutely parabolic over the last month. And they now have a market cap of over $20 billion. But we need to take a step back and look at what Oklo is actually doing, what they've actually accomplished, and where they could possibly be getting this kind of valuation from. Because at this point, Oklo has made $0 in revenue. They have no binding contracts for power purchase agreements or reactors. And quite frankly, they don't really have much of a reactor design at this point, at least not that we've seen publicly. So how did we get here? One thing we need to consider is what does Oklo's reactor design actually look like? And it's very different from what they've been talking about for the last decade or so. Oklo is currently in pre-application discussions with the NRC for its new version of the Aurora powerhouse, which has a power output of 75 megawatts electric, or probably around 250 megawatts thermal. This is a substantial increase over the original design, which was only 4 megawatts thermal, or having an output of about 1.5 megawatts electric. And the design and safety of that reactor relied primarily on things like the small size, low power output, and low heat density. But this new version being substantially larger means that that's not the case. And two things happened that caused this. One, one and a half megawatts electric really isn't enough to power a data center. You need something much larger. And 75 megawatts might be reasonable for that. And the second is that the NRC rejected the original one and a half megawatt design. In a letter from January 2022, titled Denial of Aurora Combined Operating License Application, the NRC said because Oklo has provided insufficient information for NRC staff to establish a schedule to review key safety and design aspects of Aurora, the agency is ending its custom combined operating license application review and denying the application without prejudice. Oklo has repeatedly failed to provide substantive information in response to NRC staff requests for additional information on the maximum credible accident for the Aurora design, the safety classification of structures, systems, and components, and other issues. It's very rare for the NRC to issue a denial letter like this. Usually they work with the licensee application in order to figure out some way or some solution to get to the end result that they want. But in this case, the NRC felt that there wasn't enough progress towards that goal and ended up denying the application entirely. The big issue that the NRC had with the application is what Oklo called its maximum credible accident. It was more or less Oklo's own attempt at creating a safety analysis that wasn't following any existing regulatory guidance that the NRC was used to seeing. That doesn't mean that the NRC won't look at it. The NRC was quite open in saying it was willing to look at the MCA type of approach and see if it could work it into its regulations. But problems came about in that the methodology was vague and not repeatable. And NRC staff started to identify multiple problems with the Aurora design. In a meeting with Oklo a few months before the eventual rejection, the NRC pointed out multiple areas that could cause problems, such as the potential for heat pipe failure as an initiating event with a failure to trip, which is not provided in the safety analysis report, and a long list of other problems with the design that had not been addressed. 
Ultimately, Oklo failed to provide the information to address these concerns, and the application was rejected. So Oklo went back to the drawing board and restarted its design and licensing approach. But this brings me to my point that Oklo's current design, the 75 megawatt electric one, has really only been in development for about three and a half years at best. Meaning Oklo is significantly behind development time compared to other reactor designers like TerraPower, which have been working on their design for 10 years or more. And because Oklo is only engaging in pre-application activities with the NRC, they don't actually have to show any information yet. So the information that we do publicly see is very high level and doesn't give us a lot of details about how this reactor actually is going to work or what its design looks like. On Oklo's website, we can see a few staged photographs of what the design might look like. Here on the left, it looks like there's an underground portion of a fairly tall sodium-cooled reactor that is then connected up to the power conversion units up above. We also can see this nice gentleman here explaining the fuel assembly, which appears to be a hexagonal fuel. And you can see wires wrapped around the individual fuel rods, which is typical of what we would see for a sodium-cooled reactor to help with the mixing of the flow. Oklo also claims to have a customer pipeline of 14 gigawatts, one of the largest. However, if we actually look at those deals, three of them are non-binding letters of intent, which are just promises between companies that if this works out, we'll try and sign a contract. And their largest contract is with a company called Switch for 12 of their 14 gigawatts. And again, it's a non-binding master power agreement to deliver power by 2044. So it's not exactly right around the corner. Although Oklo has technically booked 14 gigawatts of non-binding agreements, we'd still prefer to see some actual binding PPAs or construction agreements in place. Still with no tangible product or revenue, it's a little bit hard to accept a $20 billion valuation on this company. But maybe I'm being unfair. So let's look at some other companies in the nuclear space at what they're doing and what their valuation is. The best example I could think of is Cameco, the Canadian uranium mining company. Unlike Oklo, they actually produce something. They have revenue, profits, customers, tangible physical assets, long-term contracts, and they own 49% of Westinghouse, which actually sells fuel, builds reactors, does services, and all kinds of work. So if we're looking at a company that is really involved in the nuclear industry throughout all parts, both fuel, services, and reactors, Cameco is a good example. And their market capitalization is just under $40 billion. So despite doing all of these things within the nuclear industry, being very profitable at it as well, they're only worth twice as much as Oklo, who broke ground on their first demonstration plant a few days ago. In 2024, Cameco had revenue of $3.1 billion, with profits of nearly $800 million. And of that revenue, Westinghouse contributed to about $483 million. Oklo, on the other hand, is losing money. In quarter two of 2025, they had an operating loss of $28 million, primarily from payroll and expenses. But because of their recent funding, they have quite a bit of cash on hand, of between $226 million and $542 million, depending on how you count it. But either way, that means they can operate for quite a long time before they run out of cash. Which is a good position to be in. A lot of these startups don't have that kind of money, and therefore won't be able to operate for such a long time at a loss. Because Oklo is going to need to operate for many months, and probably years, without making any revenue. So again, I ask, what justifies a $20 billion valuation for this company? There are vague paths for revenue, but nothing concrete. But if we look at the other side of the argument, what are some things that Oklo could do that would justify such a valuation? Well, I would argue that one, the demonstration plant has to actually be up and running and work. It has to be technologically feasible and cost effective. They have to eventually go through and receive NRC licensing, not just the Department of Energy demonstration plant that they're building now. They have to sign actual binding PPAs or construction agreements for plants. And some of their other business lines, like the fuel recycling facility or medical isotopes, need to come online. But I don't see any of these things happening before 2030. Which means a lot of these investors that are getting in now at what might well be the peak of Oklo are going to be left holding the bag. And I'm not the only one that thinks so. If we look at the insider trading activity, which tracks various board members and directors of the company and what they're doing with their stock, we can see over the last year multiple sales from executives. We can see the chief financial officer just a few weeks ago cashed out around $10 million. And even the CEO, Jacob DeWitt, cashed out around $33 million a few months ago. So while it is normal for executives of a company to cash out stock and options from time to time, it could be an indication that the price of the stock is a bit overvalued at this point. And this is not a financial channel or financial advice, but of course I would recommend caution in any company that's gone up 1,500% in a year. And to be fully transparent, I do personally hold URA, a uranium ETF, which lists Cameco and Oklo as its two largest holdings. And while I originally acquired this ETF mostly for its exposure to uranium mining and Cameco, the surge in Oklo recently has greatly increased the percentage of the assets that are under it. 
So am I being unfair to Oaklo? Is it really a $20 billion company, despite the lack of any revenue and signed contracts? Let me know in the comments below. I'm curious to see what everybody else thinks. Anyway, thanks for watching.